Good afternoon. I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today we're adumbrating Unit 3A in Meyer's AP Psychology textbook, Examining Neural Processes and the Endocrine System. Let's get started. So let's hop right in. First, a brief introduction. What you should remember is that everything psychological is at the same time also biological. biological. So psychology and biology are very closely linked fields. Phrenology was originally invented by Franz Gall, and he stated that bumps on the, on the skull could reveal our mental abilities. This turned out, of course, to be false, but phrenology ultimately proved that the various brain regions have particular functions. So each part of your brain does something different, as shown in that picture. Now, another thing to remember is that we are all biopsychosocial systems. This means that we are each an individual system made up of smaller subsystems, made up of even smaller subsystems. So cells, organs, and subsystems is what we are. We are, As we can see, we are all biopsychosocial systems. Now we're going to talk about one of the most important cells in the body, and the most important cell from a psychological standpoint, and that's the neuron. First off, there are several different types of neurons. There's sensory neurons, there's motor neurons, and there's interneurons. All of these different types of neurons have different functions, but they all work in the same fundamental way, which we'll explore here with this diagram. So a neuron is shaped much like we see in our picture here. It has a few important points, the dendrite, the nucleus, the axon, and the axon terminal. So first, let's talk about dendrites. Dendrites receive information from other neurons. That information is then passed down through the soma, or the cell body, through the axon to the axon terminal, where that information in the form of neurotransmitters or other ions is passed on to other neurons. So that's how neurons transmit information. Uh, myelin sheath, as mentioned in the textbook, are an insulating layer along the axon. And since that layer insulates that part of the neuron, it can actually make communication even faster meaning that neurons can transmit uh, energy or transmit information from one part of the body to another. All right, so here's how neurons communicate. They use these things called synapses. So a synapse is where the terminal branches of one axon meet the dendrite of another, uh, of another neuron. So dendrites and axons do not touch each other. So what happens is the terminal branches release neurotransmitters, which are basically these little chemical messengers. And these neurotransmitters then bind to these things called receptor sites to transmit the message. So here we can see a uh, receptor site in uh, more detail. There's also a process called reuptake, which involves uh, sending, the, which involves when the sending neuron reabsorbs the extra neurotransmitters that the other neuron did not absorb. So this involves the reuptake protein. That's what sucks up the neurotransmitters, and it's highlighted in that blue circle right there. All right, next let's talk about some specific neurotransmitters and how they impact us. So here you've probably heard of a couple of these already. You've probably heard of serotonin and dopamine, but I'm guessing you haven't heard of acetylcholine or glutamate or perhaps even endorphins. Let's go through them one by one. Let's start with acetylcholine. Uh, its function is primarily to enable muscles, learning, and memory. And an example of what happens when it goes wrong is Alzheimer's disease, not being able to remember anything. Dopamine is even more simple. It influences movement, learning, and emotion. Um, and when you have too much dopamine or even too little, you'll have schizophrenia. So that's an emotional problem. When we look to serotonin, one of the most important neurotransmitters, probably the most important alongside dopamine, serotonin affects everything from sleep to arousal to hunger to mood. So a whole smorgasbord of different things. And under wow. supply of it is leaked to depression. Great word. Um, next, let's look at GABA. GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. What an inhibitor does is stop another neurotransmitter from bonding to the dendrites in a, neuro, a neuron and then thus sending the signal. So GABA stops those other five neurotransmitters from get, sending their messages. Uh, next, let's look at glutamate, which is a major excitatory neurotransmitter. It's involved in memory, and oversupply of it can lead to migraines or seizures because you have too much brain activity. Finally, endorphins. Endorphins are the natural morphine or the natural opium of the body. 
They're essentially a painkiller that the brain can release to special areas that are in pain in order to stop getting the pain signals from that area. So it's a very important neurotransmitter. Here we have a demonstration of what uh, serotonin does in kind of a fun layout. There aren't that many fun pictures for this slide, but serotonin is eatery, exercise, and education. All right, now we can talk about the nervous systems individually. So the central nervous system involves the brain and the spinal cord, while the peripheral nervous system involves everything else outside of the central nervous system. So this is mostly just your nerves all over your other parts of your body. Hmm. Now, uh, so yeah, as we can see in that picture. So there are four parts of the peripheral nervous system. The somatic system involves your skeletal muscles. It's what allows you to stand up from your chair when you want to get up. Your autonomic nervous system is responsible for your heartbeat and your digestion. Your sympathetic nervous system expends energy. So if you're taking a really hard test, like your AP psychology test, actually, well, you wouldn't be nervous because you're watching nah. this video. But let's say you're taking a history test. You're really nervous, so your sympathetic nervous system is going to expend energy and accelerate your heartbeat and slow your digestion. Lastly, your parasympathetic nervous system conserves energy by decreasing your heartbeat and lowering your blood sugar. One good one good way to remember parasympathetic is that, or uh, autonomic, sorry, is that it's automatic, auto, because it's up to like your heartbeat and your digestion. You don't have to think about it, whereas somatic, you think about standing up. You think about using your skeletal and muscle neurons. But let's look on to the central nervous system in a bit more detail. Uh, as Abe already explained, it's mostly made up of your brain and spinal cord. The interesting thing about the brain and spinal cord, which is not found in any other nervous system inside the body, is that reflexes can be triggered. So the brain doesn't have to be aware of every decision, uh, every movement decision made inside your body. So when the doctor taps your knee with the mallet and your knee kicks up, your knee kicks up, receives the message to kick up, not from your brain, but from your spinal cord. It's what's called an automatic reflex. You can do something without even thinking about it. And thus we get the phrase, no brainer. All right, so the final part of this section is the endocrine system. So the endocrine system secretes hormones in order to influence things like hunger and your sex drive. And while the nervous system sends very fast messages within like a split of the second, the endocrine system's messages are slower. However, slow and steady wins the race, so endocrine system's messages last much longer than those of the nervous system. So both the endocrine system and the nervous system are linked because they both produce molecules that act on receptors elsewhere. Now, part of the endocrine system is the pituitary gland, which is known as the master gland because it not only controls growth, but it also influences the release of hormones in other glands, so it manages the other glands. And we can see the uh, pituitary gland right there in close up. It's right next to the hypothalamus. Now the adrenal gland will sec secrete stress hormones that cause us to feel stress. And they're located right above the kidneys. So the overall message in this last part is that the brain controls the pituitary gland, which then secretes hormones to control other glands. And those other glands then secrete more hormones that go back to the brain and cause us to do things and cause us to feel things. That's the main idea of this section. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And comment down below if you have any questions. Also, make sure to check out our website at www.socialsciencesyndicate.com for even more help. As always, we'll catch you guys next time. Hit that jab, jab, put it in pocket till I get back.